Welcome back to Ty and I Guy. I am Wes Chatham, and this is my good friend Ty Frank, and we're here with the lovely Nadine Nicole and Frankie Adams, who's tuning in all the way from Australia, <laughs> land down under. Hi. <laughs> what are we talking about today, Ty? The Azure Dragon. So I'm going to say it for you so you know how to say it. <laughs> yeah. The Azure Dragon, uh -huh. 602. 602. Yeah, Azure it's a big episode because it's uh, Frankie Bobby joins the team on the Rossi. Oh, I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. Um, you know, before we get in that, I just, one thing that I wanted to talk to you about that I haven't had a chance to talk to you about is that out of all the characters, the biggest mind fuck that I think is what Frankie, uh, with, with Bobby Draper goes through to, you know, to spend generations preparing to uh, create this new world with Mars, um, being bred and built from birth to be this Martian Marine, this combat veteran, and then to have this country or this, this planet that she believed in lie to her, strip her of her title. She's now working in Scrapyard. Now she's, you know, Avastarala's right-hand man uh, going forward. So what is, uh, what is Bobby Draper's mindset like going into this season? Where, where is she at mentally? I mean, I think her journey in general has always been about identity. And then once that's completely betrayed and taken away from her, she sort of finds her place with Ava Sarala, which I love because working with Shoro is incredible. But there's still not that sense of um, military team sort of thing that she's used to. She's kind of just like this independent realm that Ava Sarala uses. And so I think once she kind of, uh, comes into the Rosinante, it's sort of this like new camaraderie that she's really used to, that she thrives in. And like, I think that's something she's been craving for a really long time. It must feel good getting back to combat from her perspective, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, the old, the old suity suit <laughs> <laughs> is back. Oh, am I allowed to say that? Yeah, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about the, the episode now. <laughs> You could talk a little bit too about the off-screen challenge with that suit. We had a long conversation about that yesterday. <laughs> Cause everybody asked us what it was like in the suits and it was like, look, I thought it was rough in our space suits until you work with the Frankie. And I always know that she's in a suit when you walk in and you see this scowl on her face and just dripping sweat. And I was like, uh-oh, today's suit day for Frankie. Look, I try my hardest to have a good attitude in that thing. I think if anyone else was in it, it'd be way worse. But um, yeah, I'm, my shoulders hurt just thinking about it. But it looks so cool in the end, so. I, I think it's most people don't realize how heavy that suit was. The helmet is really heavy, the backpack is really heavy. Yeah, I mean, what, what when you're wearing the whole thing, what is it, like 45 pounds? Something yeah, like that? And, yeah, but then towards, like, after the sixth hour, it feels like, a hundred pounds. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not only the weight of the suit, you have uh, a wetsuit underneath that weight. So right. you're in a sauna carrying weight, doing stunts. Yes. Right. Um, and that's it's because really we love hard our to move in. There's, there's one particular maneuver in season six that I was so proud of because I did not think I'd be able to move that way in the suit. And we made it work. Well, I made it work, but. <laughs> 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 and it looks so good. And yeah, when it comes out, I'll have to remind people what, what move that was. There's a scene um, that we won't talk about that's coming up in the future where I'm, I'm supposed to lay you down on your back. And because you, it, it's not flat in the suit and you were just, you kept tipping over with the back, like trying to balance on the thing. And that was the... I feel like a turtle in it. Yeah. Um, so Nadine, I think that you have one of the one of the great redemption arcs of, of the expanse. And I know, and I, I, I'm just really, we're both really impressed with like the work that you've done, especially with, um, I don't know if, uh, because you come to season three and we shoot this and then you take a season off and then, and you're basically, you know, as, as, as bad as, as a character that expanse gets, and then you come back and then now you have, now you become this, uh, a character that everybody's rooting for and everybody, even though you were just trying to kill Holden and now you come and everybody's rooting for and wanting the best um, for you. And it's such a beautiful arc and it's so well done. Uh, talk a little bit about your process, like, you know, in, in terms of how you approached it. And then did that throw you off taking a season off and then coming back? I mean, it made me nervous again when I came back. I had to go through like the re, you know. Re-entry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, but I love how that guy yesterday was like, yeah, I hated you at first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, that's good. I guess yeah. that's to what's supposed to happen. Uh -huh. um, but I think how you wrote Clarissa to kind of, it makes it easier to like her because she's kind of, she's very weak in, in the beginning. Like she doesn't really have a sense of self and, and you feel bad for her because of how her dad treats her. So there's like a tiny little bit of empathy there at the beginning because of Mr. Mao. So, um, I don't know. I, I actually used a little bit of my, of my own family and my own experiences. Um, I'm the elder sister of two and my sister's, uh, the middle child. And I, I, we talk a lot. We're really close. Um, we're a year and a half apart and she does have like middle child syndrome to the nth and we talk about it a lot. So I, I was able to tap into that with my sister. Cause she's, we call each other soulmates. And um, so I really just got to feel with her for a bit for at the beginning of that and understand that a little bit better with her um, for Clarissa. And then, I mean, just vying for, for love and acceptance and from a parent in general, like, yeah. I think we all kind of can go there. Um, I was really glad, like I wanted to come back. I wanted that chance uh, for the, the book's arcs and the redemption. And I was hoping, cause I've been characters on shows before that people hated, mm -hmm. um, like splitting up the, the best love couple or whatever. And they're like, get away from him, you slut. Like, <laughs> they're like we hate you, die. I'm like, oh, I'm not actually that, that person. <laughs> um, so it was, it was really fun. It was like, it was good to come back. And then it, I mean, the show's written so well and it, you know, it was oh, pretty Yeah, easy. I mean, obviously, <laughs> but, I, but part of it, I mean, this is your story too, because I'm going to talk about you a little bit. You, you know, you're in this show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, part of what we're doing with Amos is Amos, because we love Amos and because we trust Amos as an audience, when Amos sees the broken, hurt person inside of Clarissa that needs help, it gives us as an audience permission to see her that way too. Because we, we love Amos and if Amos sees something in her that is worthy of love and, and help, then it's okay for us to feel that way. Uh, and that's part of what we're, we're doing there with him. And he's the first to recognize it because he says, oh, she's the victim of childhood trauma. The same way, you know, because he knows that because he was the victim of childhood trauma. He sees it in her and goes, oh yeah, she's like me. Mm -hmm. And so that, that just cracks the door a little bit into what her trauma is and then the rest of the audience can kind of follow in. Yeah, I think when they had that journey back to Earth and you came down and working in the, in the machine shop and, we were, and I knew that you were headed to prison and uh, I, there was a moment, in, there, there's a, converse, a phone conversation that we have in season four. You know, in preparation with that, I, I think that looking at it and realizing that she's not evil she's not doing these things from a malicious place that she just has this strong it's this misguided love and loyalty for her father and she's been so badly treated that this is the outcome of that you know I, in that conversation i thought there was a, a really powerful and sad moment where amos gave you the opportunity to kill yourself and put you in it and that was his moment of grace yeah. and you were basically like you know I, I saw what you did there and thank you <laughs> thank you yeah. I was but like are you ever coming back <laughs> are you ever gonna come say hi like no, <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. but you can see a sense of remorse and shame you know so you get that she knows that she did something wrong and in the books you do such a good job of describing her her revelations and transformation and like getting it um, in her cell well, and, and Bobby's coming on the ship creates some chaos because, of course, uh, Amos is uncomfortable with what the ship is doing. He's uncomfortable with the whole situation. Holden's bringing Bobby on and is worried that she's going to say, well, there's also a fugitive on the ship. We should probably arrest her. And so he's trying to, like, make sure they don't run into each other. And then there's that moment where Amos goes, hits the thing and goes, hey, Clarissa, here's Bobby. You guys should just get over this, whatever it is, and then walks off the deck. So uh, there, there's a little agent of chaos thing happening yeah. here with Bobby showing up. What I love, uh, what you do so well, um, Frankie, and uh, is I love that how, and, and what was written well, is basically how you just 
kind of treat me as your pet. You out, you out <laughs> alpha, the alpha, when you come in the room, and you're like, don't you worry your sweet little buns about it, honey bun. And you have a way of just completely, like, taking that away from Amos, and Amos is like, well, I like this girl. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. something on her. I love it so much, but he is a baby compared to Bobby. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, she is the alpha in the room, and, and I think she does, she's got no fear um around him he she totally knows that he's like you know quite intense and loves to fight but there's no there's nothing to back that up so i think it's just like makes so much sense and god i love it so much. well if you watch the x-ray though because there's a great x-ray of bobby and amos uh bobby's overconfidence bites her <laughs> when it comes to uh yeah, but... amos <laughs> <laughs> i can't wait That's... to see it Oh, I can't even say, I can't say what it is, but you'll see it does, but also someone just kind of gets in, in a bad way. She, she, <laughs> she would, she would, yeah, I don't want to say You should probably it, talk a little bit about the x-rays and what it is. Coming yeah. Up. So we, we have, um, one of the things we got to do this season, uh, thank you, Amazon. We, we'd always talked about doing little mini vignettes between episodes. We'd been talking about this clear back to like season three or four. And we just never had the time or the resources or the ability to do it. This season, Amazon said, hey, why don't you guys go ahead and do that? And here's the resources. Here's the money to make them. So we got to make these five little, you know, three to five minute short stories um, with, you know, the characters from the show. And they're not important to the plot. They're not like, you know, you don't have to watch them to understand what's going on. But if you just want to know a little extra about the characters, a little scene from their past or a little scene of what they're doing now that explains some of the character motivations, uh, they're great for that. And one of one of those x-ray extras is Bobby and Amos uh, trying to out-alpha each other a little bit and leads to a, leads to a little bit of a tussle. Mm -hmm. It's very fun. I'm not going to give it away, but... Is that the one you wrote? Yeah. 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 It's written by Wesley Chatham. And um, it was you and Glenton, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Glenn. But you know, it's we, yesterday we were, you know, uh, talking about the expanse a bunch, and one of the questions that a lot of people ask is who is the most different than their characters, and hands down, mm. everybody is like Frankie. Frankie is so different than uh, <laughs> than Bobby Draper. Oh, I, I think I think she's tied with Kara. Yeah. As drummer. Tied. That's true. I, I think the two of them uh -huh. are tied for uh -huh. most different uh -huh. from their character. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. But I yeah, no, we're because both so smiley and. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I <laughs> see. Their characters are I, so extreme. I can see. And militant. You, I can see if you get on the wrong side of Kara, you can see drummer coming. So <laughs> yeah. I've never been on the wrong side of Kara. <laughs> okay. I never plan to be on the wrong yeah. side of Kara. So yeah. I've never seen that. But, but drummer is alive and well there. But but Frankie, like you know, just in terms of her demeanor and the way she moves and you yeah. know everything, like it's just such a different thing. In terms of preparation, like the physicality and like, what did you do to uh, really embody Bobby? Uh, I trained a lot. Um, I don't know. It just kind of happened when I put the the costume on. I think it was just something. Sorry about that um, beeping, rude. It's okay. Um, <laughs> we, we we've had a lot yeah, of that today. I, 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 yeah. I think I think I, I like I watched a lot of military sort of training videos, and I noticed like a lot of them had incredible posture and we're quite straight and all that sort of stuff so yeah i think it just kind of happened organically but <clears throat> i'm not like that at all i slouch and um <laughs> don't i smile a lot more than bobby does but i think bobby's kind of found her sense of humor and a, and a, and a bit of joy nowadays well we did we did make her deadlift a lot of heavy things. So I kept seeing pictures of uh, Frankie at the gym, like deadlifting a bar, just like covered in weights. I'm like, oh, is that what we're doing to her right. when she's not here? <laughs> oh, yeah. I like, uh, you know, the, the mission to take over the Azor dragon and to capture it. And there's a there's the resistance from Amos, there's a resistance from Holden. And then there's, as we're going, you have different opinion, uh, how to go about it with Holden and but you have operational command and uh i i'm just oh. <laughs> i'm just curious what what is bobby's what does bobby think of holden and especially in a combat situation like that and where does she think that she does she feel <laughs> as if like okay i need to take charge now and get this done well i think there's like a huge level of respect there and they've sort of become 
acquaintances over the years, but she has been sent there by Avasarala for a purpose. And once things, once decisions aren't being made, um, she she comes in very quickly and, and decides very quickly what's going on. And, um, oh, I love that scene. I like yell at him quite aggressively. And I don't think anyone's done that. Maybe Naomi has, but um, it was very satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love the confidence, you know, come on the show and be like, I'm in charge. <laughs> like, this is what we're going to do. And then I'm thing and you give me the command. And- well, there's a long history in military movies and stuff of the senior sergeant who has to put up with the idiot lieutenant. Uh-huh. And, you know, Holden was a lieutenant in the Navy. Bobby's a gunnery sergeant in the Marines. So that's that, that dynamic of like, I'm the one who actually understands what's going on. It's nice that you have a higher rank, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And it raises the tension. Yeah. Because you get really scared. You're like, is she right? I really trust her. No, she's very confident. But is this going to happen? You know? Yeah. Well, and it and it, <clears throat> it keys off of one of your big moments, which is there's a moment when somebody's supposed to be doing something and they hesitate. And uh, Clarissa goes, well, I'll just do it then. And just grabs the thing and takes off, which nobody had planned for, which kind of throws a monkey wrench. <laughs> I mean, it works yeah. out in the end. Yeah. But it, part of it, we were talking about her her need for love, her need to be accepted. You can really see in that moment, she's like, maybe they'll like me if I do I'll this. I'll try and do it. I'll do it, and then everybody will be my friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that what, mo- what motivated that situation? So you, we can talk. So when Naomi was, uh, she had a job to do with the with the taking over the Azure Dragon and the trauma that she experienced last season, and she just had a flashback of jumping out and she yeah. couldn't do it. And you saw that she was in trouble, and you're like, don't worry, I got this. And you go out and, and you do it. Is this Is this your motivation? because you think on some level that maybe this will win the crew's approval? Yes, especially Naomi's, because Mm -hmm. I can see in that moment, I mean, in the way that she played it, like I just genuinely was like, oh, are you okay? Like, do you need help? Like, I'll help you, you know? Um, And Naomi's, I think, the first one for her to, to win the approval of. And then in general, she's just there to serve everyone. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously like you, but the whole, your family. You know, she's we, want everyone to die. That'd be bad. She's <laughs> going down if you guys die. Like she's done. You know, this is a funny story. Cause when I saw this and I saw you throw up in your helmet, it reminds me at uh, season five um, when you and I were stuck out in the woods freezing, and they you remember that they had you throwing up constantly. <laughs> and and, uh, and I told you a secret that you kept throwing it in my face. And, and so there was a. Uh, there was this. I remember this was when you were on the couch and you were throwing up, and I can't. The, I don't remember if, if there was some, I think there was a time when like Breck was directing, it was like take after take. And I remember you uh, just ho- hovering over the bowl and I don't know what they were giving you to throw up, but I just see it like coming out of your mouth and you're like, it's like chicken tortilla could you soup please stop making me throw up? <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a, it was, the, everybody laughed, it was such a good moment. And then I see this, that they have you throw up in your mask, you know, going to the scene, but it was, this time it was CG, so that was a better experience. But it's much, a lot of time, effort, and thought, and a lot of money, and a lot of very talented artists made the most perfect CGI vomit. It was well done. Yeah, a ton (laughs) of work went into making CGI vomit. So the, the, the glamour of the entertainment industry, the glamour of television is you might wind up Making CGI vomit for a living. It looks it looks good. <laughs> I was convinced it's like, it's it's, it's, it's horrifying. It's super gross. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what's going on with her medically, with uh, with her triggering her mods, and at, and she has you know when she, at the end when she has to she gets starts to get sick and there's like a degenerative something happening with it. Yeah. So the idea there is she has a, a mechanical device and an artificial gland in her head. What she triggers this device, the gland pumps her full of hormones you know, adrenaline and a bunch of other things that give her enhanced reflexes, enhanced speed, all of those things. But it's illegal, It's this is not a legal thing. Um, and whatever, you know, back of the alley shop she got this thing installed in, um, it, it didn't pass FDA testing. Mm-hmm. And the constant trickle of these artificial hormones into her bloodstream, this constant low level trickle of it, is having uh, a health impact. Um, she's, she there, her system is, slowly starting to shut down and her body is having a bad reaction to this constant thing. And so she's, she's having to deal with that. that um, and when she triggers the mods, um, they have a serious impact on her system and it's getting worse as time goes on. What happened to that part of the scene where 
the the big missile guy is about to shoot Bobby, and they're like, Bobby! <laughs> they just edited that out, remember? We were like, scream, scream. What does uh, happen in that scene? Uh, well, so, I mean, okay, so let's talk some process. Um, <laughs> so we shoot a lot of things. Wait, have and- you guys seen it? You I've haven't seen, seen the show? You You've been busy shooting, girl. No, I haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah. You got the link probably in your email. Oh, I'm sorry. By the way, uh, Frankie <laughs> Adams is shooting uh, in Australia with Ripley right now. Yeah. Sigourney Weaver. Yeah, so. so yeah, so. Um, you're only <laughs> shooting with Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. One probably. of the greatest <laughs> actors in American history. Uh, <laughs> She's the best, one of the best humans ever, by the way. Oh, cool. I love her. She's yeah. amazing. So you have an excuse for not having watched the show that the other yeah. show that you work on. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so we I mean we shoot a lot of stuff and then it goes into the editing suite and the director has an opinion on what it should look like and the editor has an opinion on what it looks like and then Noreen has an opinion and his is the only opinion that counts. Mm-hmm. So Noreen cuts it to what he wants it to be and uh, we what we did with that scene specifically is we cut it for pace. Yeah. To make it to make everything feel like it's happening one right after another. There's no time to think, there's no yeah. time to react. It's just uh, she's doing stuff, then a bad guy shows up, then you do something, and it's just get through it as quickly as possible so that it feels chaotic. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff that sort of slowed the pace down, we just cut. So that's the joy of being an actor. You may put a lot of effort into something that no one will ever see. <laughs> In the director's cut, they'll have that scene. Yeah, yeah. When you watch the no, director's cut. No, the scene's cut. there. <laughs> it's there. Uh, it was just a reaction. It was just a screaming of Bobby's name. Bobby! We kept doing it over and over and over. But I will never forget your line. You're like, we don't want to be here when the ship takes off or it blows up. I'm like, I know. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've i come onto a show before where they've already been established and everybody knows everybody and I know what that feels like. And how was that like for you coming on and you have a crew and a cast that's been together? That's always, it's always disoriented and it's always challenging because people have been working and you kind of come on and, and you see all these people that know each other and they have this second hand. You're kind of, you're like, I haven't been a part of the process this long. Like, I don't. You know, and then you kind of go in there. So what was that like for you coming on? Twice. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it was easier probably than most because we had the table reads where everyone get together. So we got to introduce everyone and there's always good vibes. And then we went and had that really fun Halloween party. Oh, yeah. And we just had like a blast. And I don't know. We were just kind of galvanized around Toronto a bit. And we had so much fun. So I think it was easy. It was easy to integrate. So there's no like... You know, you're, so you're saying, problems. Everyone's so kind on yeah. set. Like oh, cause, so because we're so wonderful and kind, it was yeah, just like yeah. 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 I mean, you're a little intimidating. <laughs> Amos is super intimidating, but you, you're yeah. like a teddy bear. Uh, you're a good guy. Right. <laughs> everyone's, I, I, everyone's good people. I will say on the producing side, because um, it's unusual to have somebody be an important character, go away for an entire season, and come back and be an important character again. And uh, the, on the production side, like the you know the line producer and people like that, they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And we kept, every time we'd say, make sure you hold Nadine for season five, they'd be like, do we have to, is that, do we need to do that? And it was a constant fight. We have to hold her, you know, they're like, well, she's only got one episode this season, do we really have to? Yes, you have to hold her. (laughs) Like the line editor, every chance they were trying to cut that, every chance they got because they just didn't understand it. And then it almost got dropped and I was like, is this gonna happen, is it not? Uh, Do I have to wait another year? Yeah, they they just, it's it's not a thing that you see a lot in TV. So they just didn't get it, they didn't understand it. Like, why does she have to come back? Hundreds of people involved on set and acting and producing, it's like. You know, uh, Frankie, I remember the first time when you came to Toronto um, and you, I don't know if you remember, but we all went out and we had a good time. And I just think about you when I first met you and now and how much you've grown and the work that you've done on this show is just so incredible. And not to ask too big of a question, but on a personal level, like what has this show meant to you and, and what, it, what have you learned going through? Gosh, that's, no, that's actually a really good question. I think, well, I was only 22 when I got the jobs so i think if anyone can imagine from there until just now, a baby almost yeah. 28 now yeah there, a lot of changes happen in anyone's life so being on a show was a lot of responsibility but i think it really built my confidence it, it allowed me to come into my womanhood find certain parts of strength in me that i did not know existed and build really lifelong friends also to be with a character for many years 
was a great challenge and like taught me how things can develop. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel very, I see, I see shots of Bobby now on, on season five and six and I'm like, I am grown. Like, <laughs> like really? And, and yeah, and I think everyone has probably seen that, well, all of you guys who know and love me, but um, yeah, I definitely feel very grown up and a lot of the experiences that I learned on that show, I will take with me forever. And how, how would you say that Bobby's different from when we first see her till now? Oh gosh, I think, I think similarly she's, she's grown up too. Um, uh, she thinks before she does things. She's got more confidence in, in her voice and her opinions and what she knows. Um, yeah, I mean, she, she didn't take any shit at the beginning and now she really doesn't take any shit and I really like that. Also, she looks older too, like I do. <laughs> I mean, is it fair to say that along with that not taking any shit, uh, there's a bit more playfulness to her in these later seasons where she, the, her confidence allows her to be a little more playful? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think she's got this um, charm and sense of humor that I really love to play because it doesn't take away from how badass she is. I think it just adds to it. Um, so, yeah, I'd say she's a little more relaxed in that way. Did you guys write her like that because um, I'm funny? <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm answering as if I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you when, when Wes was writing all of the scripts this year <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah he, he thought it was important that's like when, yeah, that's when, why we when, that. when, when Frankie when Frankie and I like when we give interviews we like to say we improv all of our scenes <laughs> like we make up our lines as we go we don't have any writers what are you talking about that's just off all the top of our head so now that Frankie Bobby has answered the question, so I think we have to ask you the same question. Are you a different person now than when we started this? How have you changed? What has the expanse sure. done to your psyche? Um, I mean, <laughs> I always grow a lot. Like I as Nadine love, love growing and development. So I do a lot of work, but this has been my first like big sh show. I'm mm. this, so I feel like I'm still a growing artist. Um, and for a series reg contract. So being able to do multiple years with, you know, and then with the role as Clarissa, that was ex really challenging at first and made me really nervous. I didn't know if I was going to be capable of delivering it in a way that did it real justice. Um, so of course, like I've learned so much. Um, we were talking about this yesterday, the very beginning of when we went to go shoot season five I always write down my goals for every year and then I was writing down like want to work with the best of the best so we could like level up and learn and, and well, I, I hope that happens for you someday <laughs> <laughs> and I was working with him we were it was working. the inverse of those goals that happened to you <laughs> I have to write that again for this year no, but we were working in the cabin. We were doing that scene about the monster poem and that yeah. was like a really fun hard week um but I just remember you coming and showing up and like you you would nail a lot of your first takes. Like you just do that a lot. You don't really drop a lot of lines. And I was just like, oh, okay, like I need to work harder. I need to show up and be a little bit more like Wes. And um, just seeing everyone on set, like and, and Sheree's power and um, when Ashford was there, like I would just go to set just to watch him and learn. Um, yeah. And then just the process with you guys. I don't know if it's like that on every set where the writers and the execs are so available to talk about any, you know, high concept or character development, but it was just, I felt like held. Um, so then I could lean into it and develop and grow real fast. And I think that, you know, any projects that I may do in the future, I hope that it like lives up to the half as much as I've learned here, you know? Uh -huh. uh, it, it, it will probably be much better written and much meaner. <laughs> we're, we're not very talented, but we're really nice. Yeah, that's, that is the saving grace of our show. We're all really nice. What did you learn, Wes? Stephen and I did have a conversation um, one day, and we were talking about, I was talking about what is motivating us to get in this business, and why are we doing what we do? And when I was younger, there were um, film and television, there were certain projects that were so powerful to me. They meant so much. And they were more than this fictional story that I saw. I mean, it, it was something that I kind of took and I carried with me and it helped me understand life better, helped me understand the world better. 
And what I said to him is, you know, my whole motivation and my whole, you know, goal is to be just be a part of something like that, something that's important and something that um, can shed a little light on the world around you and just, you know, tell a story that has truth and reality and that's beautiful and sad. And, and, uh, and then we both look at each other and we, we've said, you know, if we can finish the expanse and we can continue the level that we feel like the show has been and continue working as hard as we can. And this was season three. We didn't even know if we were getting season four, but we we're like, if the dream is, is if we can come to that, bring this show to completion, um, then the expanse could possibly be that thing, that thing that it has the same impact on other people's lives that, that meant so much to us. And it's kind of like the, the, the planet for giving, you know, whatever we have to give to this thing. Um, and I hope, and I feel personally that, that we may achieve, we may have of achieved that. And that's, that's so fulfilling. And, uh, so now I can just quit and go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I think we could all just retire fans. now. Yeah. We yeah. Just, we're good. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> but uh all right. Well thank you guys for hanging out. And uh this was uh six oh two and thank our guests. Thank you for coming all the way from Australia. Thank you for coming all the way to Australia. I feel so honored. <laughs> I feel so honored. Please tell Ripley we said hello. I will I will definitely let her know. <laughs> all right. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Say goodbye, Ty. <laughs> goodbye, Ty. <laughs>